Now, uh, <clears throat> in terms of zakah, you will notice that you know the Prophet sallallahu tells us, "Buni al-Islamu ala khams shahadati an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad rasulullah wa iqam al-salah wa itay zakah wa hajj al-bayt wa sawm Ramadan." That Islam is based on five, which is normally translated as five pillars. On one is the shahada, it's a testified to the oneness of Allah and the messenger of Muhammad. And then, you know, to make salah, establish salah, to give zakah. And then in this particular hadith, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned to make hajj and then fast in Ramadan. And you will hear the khatib and the Muslim community generally, we will talk about shahada. Believe in Allah and Tawheed. We will talk about the Messenger of Allah. We will talk about Salah. We'll talk about Hajj. Uh, when Hajj season comes around, we will talk about fasting when Ramadan comes around. But rarely do you hear us talking about Zakah. And the reason, one of the reasons why we don't discuss Zakah too much, in Ramadan we do it a little bit, but it is because it is extremely complicated and it has a lot of math, as um, Riyadh was mentioning, and it gets to the lay person, it becomes a very difficult thing to digest. Tonight, what we want to do is to give a basic overview, um, and you will get to also see some of the complexity um, about this particular topic, because as Muslims, if Islam is based on five pillars, we need to have at least a rudimentary understanding of what those five pillars are and what they are, what is the construct behind them. So let us begin, and as I said, we have quite a few to quite a few things to cover. <clears throat> the first thing to know is that there's two terminologies, zakah and sadaqah. And there's a difference between these two. Both is involved in giving. Sadaqah, literally the root meaning of sadaqah, it means to be sincere, to be truthful. And the word itself, sadaqah, means charitable act. You know, something that you, you do alms giving. Uh, uh, and the difference between zakah, zakah is also giving, but zakah is compulsory, it is defined, it has specific rules, it is regulated uh, in, in exactly how you have to give, when you have to give, who you have to give. Whereas sadaka, it's more or less open. It's a voluntary giving. You can decide how much to give, when to give, who to give, and it's all open. So that's a, a voluntary um, giving that we do that has no limits, has no conditions. Uh, it's just up to you as an individual if you want to give at any time and what you want to give. So there's a difference between that. But these two terms, sometimes they're used in the Quran uh, to mean the same thing. So you will hear people say sadaqatul fit, which is the sadaqah we give at the uh, Eid. But they will also call it zakatul fit. And both is equally acceptable terminology. So sometimes, sometimes when Allah talks about zakah, he uses the word sadaqah like in the same ayah that we will show you. And so they are sometimes used interchangeably, but the, real, the, the, the true understanding is zakah is very specific. Sadaqah is sometimes used to mean zakah, uh, but sadaqah as a terminology is voluntary giving. Zakah is conditional and has specific rules. As I say, you see, it already gets confusing. All right, let's move forward. <laughs> Uh, so zakah as a term, in terms of the dictionary meaning, it carries a few. The main two meaning that zakah has is purification and increasing on something. So when you give zakah, the idea is that it increases your wealth and it purifies your wealth. It's an extraordinary thing to understand that when I'm giving from my wealth, that's a way of increasing it. It doesn't seem to make sense logically. Because if I give from my wealth, and my wealth is supposed to be decreasing, not increasing. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that when you give zakah, your wealth is actually going to be increased. Even though physically it looks like you're decreasing your wealth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala returns more to you. So you actually indirectly, Allah is going to give you back more than you give. And so you, you're actually going to be increasing your wealth. <clears throat> uh, Islam takes these literal terms and give them Islamic meaning. And so it really means the transfer of a portion of wealth that has been specified, two and a half percent, to a poor Muslim, uh, or those lists of categories which we'll come to, in a manner that you're only doing it because it is a legal ruling that Allah has established, 
and you have to make sure that you give that purely for the pleasure of Allah. You can't say I'm giving this person zakah, but then I will attach some conditions to it. Because usually when you have the power, you have the wealth, and here's a poor person, and you're trying to give them zakah, we tend to sometimes have a tendency to expect back a favor from them. You're not allowed to do that. Um, so the, this terms of a terminology, these are the, the, this is the important uh, thing of it. Now, zakah is usually considered the third pillar of Islam, with shahada being the first, salah being the second, and the third pillar being zakah. And they usually mention salah as the fourth and hajj as the fifth pillars. Um, so it is a, by being a pillar of Islam, it is one of the foundational principles of our religion and practice that we have to do. It is mentioned in the Quran is many times, it appears almost 32 times in conjunction with salah. You know, when in the ayat 177 of Surah Baqarah, when Allah talks about what is righteousness, he mentions it, that one part of righteousness is to establish salah and give zakah. So these salah and zakah gets linked together many, many times in the Quran. Uh, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking you to, salah helps you to purify yourself as an individual in your relationship with Allah and zakah tends to purify all the stuff in dunya that you may possess and that you have acquired, how do you purify that? And so they tend to go together. Zakah purifies our wealth. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Allah has made it a source of purification for your wealth. Very clear, very straightforward. So whenever you give of your zakah, then this purifies. And how it purifies? Because Allah mentioned another place that part when he gives a person a degree amount of wealth, he places some of the poor's money in your wealth. So within the wealth of the rich, Allah has put some money that belongs to the poor. And so when you give back the poor that money, your wealth becomes purified. If you keep it, then your wealth is not purified. And so part of purifying your wealth is to give back through zakah that, because Allah has given you included in your wealth, a portion that is for the poor. And uh, <clears throat> zakah also purifies the person. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, take sadaqah from their wealth in order to purify them and sanctify them with it and invoke Allah for them. Verily, your invocations are a source of security for them. And so when we get people to give zakah, it purifies the person as well. It frees them from greed and all the other things that comes with it. They develop empathy for the world. They de develop a different worldview. And so giving zakah, Allah says, purifies you as well. Um, there's consequences if we don't pay zakah because it's an obligation that's due on us. And just like salah, if you don't fulfill these five obligatory, what is called ibadat in Islam, the, the five main forms of worship to Allah, the four, which is zakah, salah, salam, and hajj, they, as we said, they are pillars and they have specific commands in relation to them. And when you neglect any of those, there are consequences both in this world and the hereafter. And here's a consequence of zakah. That's why Abu Bakr and Umar and all the Khalif, they would go after the people if they refused to give zakah. Abu Bakr waged war against people for refusing to give zakah. Whomever Allah has bestowed wealth and he does not pay zakah, then that wealth will come like a serpent with horns and will circle him and uh, be, you know, be a source of distress for them to, to jaw bones and say, I'm your wealth, I'm your hoarded treasure. And so this is in Bukhari and Muslim. So we don't want to play around with zakah. We want to make sure that we understand it a little bit and that we are giving our zakah properly. Um, a lot of times Muslims just take out some money and they give it and say, this is zakah. You know, that is not adequate and it's not proper. We got to learn a little bit about it. Okay, so in order for you to become eligible to pay for pay zakah, you must fulfill the following conditions. You must be sane. Uh, we are not obligating people who have mental problems or who are not well 
that we expect them to be able to give this zakah because they're not processing things properly. You have to be safe. You have to be an adult. We don't take zakah from children. Um, you must possess what is called a nisab. Um, we will come to that in terms of what it is, but you have to possess the amount of wealth equal to that level uh, before the zakah becomes due on you. If you don't have the amount equal to the nisab and you're below that, then you're entitled to receive zakah. You don't have to give. When you must be Muslim, we do not obligate non-Muslims to give zakah. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his wisdom uh, has specified who the zakah must go to. Uh, and so he has listed eight categories of people. Uh, in this one ayah, in Surah Tawbah, Allah said zakah expenditures are only for the poor, for the needy, for those employed to collect zakah, for bringing hearts together for Islam, for freeing captives, for those in debt, and for the, who, for the cause of Allah and for the stranded traveler. An obligation imposed by Allah and Allah is knowing wise. And if you notice in this ayah, innama sadaqatu, Allah uses the word sadaqa to refer to zakah here, right? Um, so these are the eight categories of, of people in whom we have to give our zakat to. And we need to go through them briefly one by one. Now, he mentioned the poor and then he mentioned the needy. So these are two different terms in the Arabic, uh, which is the, the fakir or the fuqara and the masakin or the miskin. And so there is a difference between the fuqara and the miskin, the poor and the needy. The poor, or a scholar says, the poor is in a worse place. Go back to the other slide. Yeah, the poor is a person who can't afford to cover even half of their expenses. You know, they're below, they, 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 whatever the expenses are, they can't even cover half of it. And the needy is the ones who can cover just about half. So the poor is even in worship than the needy. The fuqara is considered even in bad worship than the, the miskin. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned one of the people who are entitled to receive zakah is those who they get the state would use because of the magnitude of the task in the Islamic state, they will pay people to go around to be uh, collectors for the zakah. They will go and knock on the people's door and require the zakah from them. And in order for them to do that job, some zakah money can be allocated to pay for that. So you have this very peculiar situation in which you may employ someone who as an individual is giving zakah, but then because he's also a zakah collector, he's receiving zakah as well. Right? So you can have a situation where because of the two different roles, one is giving and one is receiving and it's the same person. Uh, the, those whose hearts have to be reconciled. Now this is the people who, uh, they have an inclination towards Islam. They're willing to accept Islam. They are almost there. And in order to, to make their hearts suffer, if you, you realize that you know by helping them, in their hardship financially, maybe they may see the kindness of Islam and may want to accept it. Um, then in that case, you can give the zakat to such persons. Now that raised a lot of issues among the scholars because it means that these persons are not necessarily Muslims yet. And so there's a whole big discussion if you can give zakat to non-Muslims. and. Uh, the scholars have broken up into four different groups regarding the issue of giving zakat to non-Muslims. So the Hanafis, they say, no, zakat is only for Muslims, cannot be given to non-Muslims. Then you have the other three mazhab. They said, look, this ayah is talking about giving for the softening of people who have a soft place for Islam and really wants to come in but they're not there yet, these are non-Muslims, then in that case, we can give it to those people. There's a third group that says, look, if there's no Muslims available 
and you have a situation where we can't find eligible Muslims to give the zakat to. And this happened in the time of Omar ibn Abdulaziz in which they couldn't find poor Muslims. They had developed the society in such a way that everybody was okay. And so they couldn't find any poor Muslims. So they, they said, look, in that case, you can give it to non-Muslim. And then you have a fourth view which says, zakah can be given to anybody. And they said, look, poor doesn't specify whether it's Muslims or non-Muslim. Needy doesn't specify it's Muslim or non-Muslim. So they said, look, the zakah can be given to anybody. So you have all four of these different opinions that exist in terms of giving zakah to non-Muslims. Uh, emancipation of slaves or scholars have expanded this idea. Initially, it used to be where in that society, people owned people. They had slaves. And so you could use the zakah money to go free a slave, buy him out from his master. And so that is an important um, use of the zakah. Now that has been expanded in the opinion of the scholars to also include like prisoners, that somebody is being held a prisoner, that you could take the zakah money to help free that prisoner. Or if someone gets kidnapped and there's a ransom being asked for their freedom, because the idea they said of this emancipation of the slaves is to free that person to become that for that individual to become a free person. And in this case of prison and kidnapping, it is also for the same goal of getting that person to become free again. So they expanded that idea of saying you can use this account money for that. Paying off debts, people who have um, are in great deal of debt, then you can give zakat to help them to alleviate that debt. And the way of Allah, this feasibility, uh, uh, initially the understanding of this used to be that this area of expenditure was just for the people who were making jihad in the battlefield. But this, ex this understanding have now been changed tremendously and the scholars have now expanded Expanded this idea that visa is a generic term, and they say visa means anything that you do in the service of the religion will fall under this category. So that means now the door has been opened to pay for an Islamic school, to pay for scholarships, to help people pay salaries, to to do construction work. Even some uh, places are used even for the masjid, and so they have expanded this understanding. Dr. Yusuf al Khadawi he wrote a, a book on zakah. He took 17 pages of that book to explain just this one phrase of what and the zakah can be used for. So now we have in the current um, understanding is that this phrase is very broad. And so the zakah money can be used for a variety of things. And you will see Islamic organizations will collect zakah and use it for many different projects that benefit Muslim because they say anything in the service of the religion in the way of Allah will fall under this category and then wayfarer someone is traveling here again this person in his own country may be giving zakah but because he's a traveler in this country at that particular period of time he's eligible to collect zakah as well and so these are the eight categories of people that the Quran mentions that we have to give our money to um, in terms of zakah and hopefully at least we get a little bit of an idea. Um, so now generally all of us, when we hear zakah, the priority is really the poor because they are the needy. So even though you have all these eight, most communities, 90% of their money, they go to give it to the poor. Now the poor, when you are deciding who is poor, it's important to understand that we don't count the living quarters, the food, the, the furniture, and the day-to-day -day existence of a person as being um, part of their asset in terms of nisab. We'll come to how, how you determine a nisab. So they're considered poor, even though they may have stuff in their house, right? Um, and the person who is most preferential that you should give your zakat to is your relatives. If you have poor relatives, they deserve and should be the first people who you should give your money to. You're the person's poor relatives. And very important, we do not lay any condition to the giving of the zakat and we don't have to inform 
or embarrass the person by telling them this is zakat money. You can help them and give them without informing them that this is zakat. So that they don't feel embarrassed and feel, oh, you know, that you're doing them a handout of faith or whatever. So you don't have to, it's not conditional that you must inform the recipient. Uh, we discussed paying the zakat to non-Muslims. Now, when you are giving zakat out, there are some people you are not allowed to give to. I mentioned relatives, but there are some relatives that you are not allowed to give to. A person who is giving zakat can't give it to their child or grandchild. You can't give it to your parents or grandparents. Uh, and you can't give it to your spouse. Because these are the immediate family that you have. They're not your wider relatives. They are your immediate family. And you are obligated by the religion already to take care of these people. So you don't use the zakah money as a way of taking care of them. You're obligated to take care of them beyond and above just zakah. So zakah is not allowed for you to give it to this because then what happens is that you just, the idea of zakah is to spread the wealth to others outside. And if you just give each other the zakah, then that doesn't spread to anybody beside your immediate household. And so this is not correct. Um, for the zakah to be valid, you have to have the intention at the time you're giving it. This is an important condition that I'm giving the zakah. Number two, uh, you are giving it to the correct category of people. If you give outside of that category, then the zakah is not valid. And the third is that you have got to make sure that the person owns whatever you're giving it. You can't say to the person you're giving zakah, to, you know what, send me the invoice for your hospital and I will pay it with the zakah money for you. You know, then that person doesn't get ownership of it. You've got to give that person ownership of it, or you say, I'll take out, you know, a fund in your name or whatever it is. No, you have to make the physical money go to the person and they decide how they should use it. You are not allowed to make decisions for them in deciding how this wealth will be spent on their behalf. So they have to have the, they what they call tamlik, the, the, the physical ownership of the funds for the zakat to be valid. Now, we're going to go to the fun part. <laughs> so that's some basic idea we've learned, right? How conditions we're giving, persons to give, uh, and all of that. Now, we need to look at how do we go about doing this giving. So we're going to look at it from a number of viewpoints. Personal business, debt you owe, owed to you, debts that you owe, Nisab, and how this whole puzzle works together. All right. I want to say to you that um, you will hear me continuously mention that there are many different opinions in the matter, uh, but we can't go into, like non-Muslim, for example, that's four opinions right there. But whatever I mention, I, I will tell you that there are other opinions, but we have to pick something for convenience. Now, first one is, Assets owed for personal use. So any asset that you own for personal use is usually exempted from zakah, except your cash, your silver, and your gold. All right. So if you have a chair in your house, you have you own a particular house, you're living in it, you know, that you're using all the things that you have in your house, no matter how expensive they are. They are not counted as part of the assets you're going to count up to decide if you are you have to pay zakah, except cash in the bank, gold, silver. So all your other assets, they are not counted as part of your zakah. Um, if you are in a situation where your income is fluctuating. So you start by being, I'm eligible to pay zakah on the 1st of January. Then during the year I gone down. I'm not eligible, I'm eligible to receive. Then in June your business do good again and then you become eligible to receive and then, and so you have this fluctuation between um, having the nisab and not having the nisab. 
um, the most popular opinion is that you should look at the first day when you have the money and then at the end of the year, then you, you see how much money you have and you pay on that. So you don't go through all the fluctuation throughout the month. So it's paid on the assets that you own at the end of that year. If that asset at the end of the year, from where you started with being above the NISAB and then in the year you're above the NISAB, doesn't matter if you went down below during the year, it's still counted as one year. It's still counted as if you have the money for one year because you began with $3,000 and you ended with five, even though that 3,000 went down to a thousand and fifty dollars and come up back, as long as at the end of the year you are above, you consider that you have a year of the NISAB continuously. Because that's one of the conditions to give zakah. You have to have it over a year. Zakah is not payable on haram income. In fact, you usually are recommended by the scholars to donate all your haram income away in Sadaqah. But uh, it's not counted as far haram income. Now, zakah on livestock and agricultural products, we are not going to cover this in this lecture today because it's terribly detailed and complicated. I will just give you like a bird's eye quick picture. First of all, if you have agricultural crops, they have to check to see whether the crops was watered naturally or you used artificial means to water the plants. Like you bring, you had machinery, bring plants. So if it's if it was crops that grew naturally, then you have to give 10% of that away in zakah. If it was artificial machinery that you brought in, you give 5% away in zakah. They also consider whether the crop is a fresh crop that can be dried, freeze dried versus fresh. And there's lots of details in terms of how they calculate the difference. Animals, same thing. They have so many sub conditions of the animals. So if you have, for example, 36 to 45 camels, then you have, you are, you have to give zakah of one camel that has an age of two years. And that's the kind of, it's very detailed, very, very long. Um, so we are not being, going to be able to cover that. Um, if you have a specific case, then, you know, we could answer that specific question, but the, the charts and the tables of these is very detailed. Uh, gold and silver asset. Now, if you have something that is gold, uh, completely gold, whether it's a sword or some bowl or something, um, and it's either completely gold or completely silver, then you are required to pay zakah from it. If you have something that is mixed between gold and silver, then what you will do is, if you have a completely gold item and no other asset except gold, then you will calculate the zakah based on the gold value. If you have silver mixed with it, then you will use the silver, which is a lower thing to calculate your zakah. So you're able to pay more. Um, if you have gold plated stuff, it is not considered subject to zakah because it's not real gold or real silver. It is just like a gold plated um, item um, that you have on your own. And these are personal items. I'm not talking about items where you're buying to sell back. These are personal assets as the heading says. So you have a personal asset that is gold plated, then you don't have to pay zakah. But if it's pure gold or pure silver, then you do that. Um, in terms of the business, there's a general principle in the business that says you are you have to pay zakah on the merchandise that you sell, but you don't pay zakah on the means in which you produce the product. So your machinery and the the methodology or the items that you need to produce the product, you don't pay zakah on that, but you pay zakah on the product that you produce and you're selling. So first issue is your intention. So if you buy a bunch of goods with the idea to resell them, not to keep them for personal use, then the whole stock that you buy for resale will be subject to zakah based on the selling price that you're going to sell it at and then you will calculate from that. If you have bought stuff and you want to hold it, you're not really gonna sell it right now. You know, you just are going to either use it 
to produce another asset, then you're going to pay Zaka on the asset. But the item which you're going to hold, you're not paying, as you said, you're not paying Zaka on goodwill or fixed equipment that you use to produce the good. Third, if the item that you are, like you have a clear intention to, to buy a property, to live in, if it's a personal asset, then it's not Zakat. But if you're in the business of buying and selling properties, then that becomes a commodity. So in that case, the houses that you're going to buy for resale, that would be Zakatable. Or if you have a taxi business, uh, you wouldn't pay on the, the taxi you own, but the taxis that you're going to buy and the income you're going to get, you're going to pay. So um, as I said, the means to produce the asset is not Zakatable. But the, whatever it is you produce, you have to pay Zakat on. So that's like a general rule. If you're not sure what you what you're going to do with this asset, then you know you basically have to whenever you decide what you want to do, whether it's personal, whether it's commercial at that time. But if while you're keeping it, you're making some income. You know, when you're not sure if I want to resell it, I want to keep it. If it's making income, then the zaka is due on that income. Now, sometimes we buy assets and we don't want to resell immediately. Uh, like business owners, if you are, um, you buy a bunch of stuff, as we mentioned just now, um, the zakah is payable on the stuff that you are buying to resell and not on the equipment to the property. Secondly, shares. Shares is a very, in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu they didn't have the system of shares and stock as we had, as we have. And this area is extremely complicated and detailed. Now, so we cannot go into all of the views, but I want to suffice to say, I give you just as an example again. Um, if you buy some stocks in a company, first thing you have to decide, am I buying this stock to resell it quickly, like to turn it over, buy and sell stocks and shares. So you buy a set of shares and then you want to resell them. So you're doing it as like a day trader kind of thing. In that case, that stock or share will be looked at as, as merchandise that you're peddling. And so whatever it is you're selling it for the time of the zakat period, you will pay on that. But if you're buying the shares, not to resell them, but to keep them there and to earn dividend from them over a period of time, then they classify this in a different way. They said, look, you are now like a part owner of the company because you're not selling back the shares, you're keeping it. And now you are in essence, like part of that company in order to decide how much Zakai you pay, you don't have to go and study and calculate with an accountant that company and how it works out its stocks and value because you are now like a, considered like a part owner. And it goes complicated from there going all the different scenarios. And sometimes they consider you buy shares in, in agricultural goods. Now is it zakatable in an agricultural format, which is the 10% or the two and a half percent. So there are many, many, about five, six, seven different opinions, and each of them have sub subdivisions of opinions. Uh, properties, as again, if you have a bunch of properties, you pay zakat only on the, that becomes, a, you know, you, you, the income that you're making from this, this becomes your means of production. And so the income you make from it is what is going to be given zakat. If you have pension that you're receiving, um, and these are assets which you don't intend to sell immediately. So you have a pension that come, you have to decide if I'm going to invest it as it comes. And then as you make money off of that investment, then you will pay. If you set up a child trust fund, usually you don't pay Zaka on that year after year. When the child becomes 18 years of age, the child will collect whatever is left of it and they will pay the Zaka on that amount when a year of it passes over. Um, regarding debts, these are debts that other people owe you. So in, in other words, part of my wealth is not just what I have, 
but also there are people out there who owe me money. So I, I have to factor that in, in terms of my calculation for the zakah. So if, for example, that you have loaned people, people buy stuff from you, commercial goods or whatever it is, and they bought stuff from you, and they didn't pay you yet, like business loans, they don't pay you, they're paying you next, whatever it is. Then you have to, uh, the goods is still considered that you own it until you receive your money. And so until you get your money, you will have to be, it has to be considered that you own this, this stuff still, and you have to pay a car on it. When you do get your money, then it goes into your pool and then you calculate from that. If there's some kind of money which gets owed to you, like somebody left you some inheritance, which is not really your initiative. You know, um, you mentioned like hola, hola means when, when uh, somebody divorce and the divorce is initiated by the woman and not the man, then she is required to give back the dowry to the man, to her husband or ex-husband. And so that becomes an, some money that he's going to be receiving, right? It's a debt that she owes to him. So those kinds of things, uh, until you get them, you, you do not calculate zakah for them because they are still speculative. And until you receive them physically, then uh, Islam always likes to make sure you're operating from a basis of certainty. And so you wait until you receive whatever those things that are owed to you. Um, like a sister, for example, she married a brother and he promised to give her the dowry and then he didn't give it and it's owed to her and he keeps promising her. So that's like money that she owns, but she don't have to give zakah until it comes to, till he actually actually receive it or unpaid salary and all of those kinds of things. And then you have, um, the other kind of debt that people may owe to you is um, you sell some stuff, like individually, you just sell a bunch of stuff and the person didn't pay you yet. Again, uh, there's two opinions on this matter, right? That you could begin to pay um, or towards that eventual collection of the money or you can wait until the person brings the money to you and then you begin to calculate your year. So you can calculate your year at the time of the sale. So I just lend, I just sold your car. So I begin to count my one year now that you owe me this money and you, you brought it in at the ninth month, but I will consider that I've just had this money for nine months. Or you could say at the time I receive it, that's when my year will begin. And now I will count one year going forward from that date to be able to um, decide when I pay the zakah on it. So these are some of the, the complications with when people owe you debt. And if it's bad debts and you really can't have any way of recovering it, then you don't pay any zakah on it because you don't, you don't have the idea that you're actually gonna cert certainly receive it back. So that's debt owed, others owe you. In relation to the debts that you owe other people, so if you owe debt to others, then you have to deduct that before you calculate your zakah. Because this is money that you have owed to someone, and so you can't consider that you really have it. So you have to deduct that uh, from your zakah total. Um, if you find that you're going to be paying it back within 12 months, then you could calculate it for that year. But if you find that the debt, you're not going to be pay, paying it back in this next year, then they don't factor in in your zakah. And if you're doing installments, monthly payments and so on, then you can also, uh, you can also calculate and says, look, I, I'm going to take this 12 months that I'm paying installments and work out, um, deduct that from your zakatable amount. And so um, many of you probably already lost you, <laughs> but uh, I think it's important for you to uh, have some idea whether how complex it is or not, but the idea that um, 
our scholars have taken a great deal of effort to make sure that we are able to pay our zakah and they have detailed these rules in a beautiful way. All right, so um, if you buy houses on an Islamic um, houses, they don't count houses bought with riba and mortgage don't get factored in for zakah. Um, so if you have, there are two, two different ways in which you can um, buy houses. Number one is what is called morabaha, which is like, you see a house, you have somebody who can give you the money. And the two of you make an agreement, the house costs $600 and you say to the person, look, can you lend me 600? The person says, well, what am I going to get? Or how am I going to make money? So you agreed with the person that, look, if you lend me 600, I know you need to make profit on your money. I will pay you back 900. So now you begin to pay towards that. And so the person makes a profit over a period of time. It is a way of bypassing riba. The other way is to say, so in when you have that case, then your 12 months that you're paying towards that is part of um, your zakah calculation you have to make. But if you have a situation where another way in which they allow you to buy house is where you and the partner, the financial partner, come to a decision that we are going to both purchase this house. I will put 10%, you put 50% or I mean 90%. And we're both going to own the house. You, owe, you, the bank owes ninety. You owe ten, which you put as a deposit. And then, you, you, if you are going to live in it, we have to decide how much rent it would bring. And then each month, based on the market, we will say, okay, you are living in it. So every month, I'm going to give you ninety percent of the rent, and I will take ten percent because I owe ten percent. And then I will try to increase my payment to eventually buy you out. And so I will get 10, then I will pay an extra when I can afford it, then I will get 10, 20, and then I will get 30. And of course, the rent that you're paying will be all prorated based on how much you continue to eventually owe until you buy out the house. They say in this case, both of you are actually owning this house. And so the zakah doesn't become due. You don't have to make zakah payments until eventually you own the whole of house. And if you decide that you're not going to, you're going to make it an investment property or not, then you pay at that time. Um, the, so those are um, some of the different arrangements in terms of Saka. So quick recap. Oh, I, I, I forgot to mention um, in terms of gold and silver, one of the questions that usually is asked is about jewelry. Like you have gold jewelry and silver jewelry and so on. Generally jewelry for men, you have to pay zakah on it. But for the women, there's a difference of opinion in relation to if zakah is due on jewelry. And so um, Abu Hanifa, the Hanafi school, they say that if you have jewelry, gold jewelry and silver jewelry, then you should pay zakah on it. The other three mazhab, they said no. And there's long detail uh, evidence that they give for each position. But they said by and large, no, if you're using the jewelry for personal, um, it's part of your personal asset, no matter how expensive it is. Um, and this is only for the gold and silver jewelry. Jewelry of like diamonds and rubies and all of that, you don't pay zakah on. But the gold and silver jewelry, Hanafi say yes. The other mazhab says no, we don't have to pay on the jewelry. Um, okay, so if your intention is to resell fully, then you have to add that value to the business assets. So we have a little um, case study. This is just a recap. And uh, before we get into it, let's talk about the Nisab a little bit. So the Nisab is the amount of wealth that you need to have to be able to give zakah. If you don't possess this amount of wealth, then you will be entitled to receive zakah. So this is a very important um, 
thing. So the Prophet Sallallahu he set it up as what I call mithqal of gold, but it's equivalent in terms of grams, 87.48 grams of gold and 612.36 grams of silver. So if you have the equivalent of 87.48 of grams of gold or 612.36 grams of silver, and of course these are two vast difference in price, then if you have that amount, then you are eligible to pay zakah, you have the nisab. If you have less than that, then you're entitled to receive zakah. So if someone possesses only gold, then they should pay their zakah in gold. Other than that, they should pay it in silver. Um, I went and I checked what is the current market price for 87.48 grams of gold. They usually change daily or weekly. Um, so it's about $5,195 of gold. Zakah is payable on savings, not, not your whole asset. When you take out all your expenses and everything, what is left as savings, then if that saving comes up to more than $5,185 and you have it for a year, then you pay zakah. If you're calculating it based on silver, then if you have $496, after you deduct all your expenses and everything, and you have this extra savings of 496 for more than a year, a year or more, then you have to pay the zakah on that, on whatever the amount is. So, which two and a half percent to 10 percent? The minimal is two and a half percent. I just want to mention that a lot of people they only know the two and a half percent. So zakah is only paid when you reach that level of your nisab on your zakah anniversary, which means your one year. Uh, if you're not sure about the year and the date when the money is coming, you should make an estimate. Okay, I remember January 1st. Let me start or pick a date. A lot of the people, they do their zakah in Ramadan. So they will say, okay, the first week in Ramadan to the first week in Ramadan the next year. That will be my year. And so they will donate their, calculate their zakah in Ramadan and donate their money in Ramadan. And the reason is because of course, the deeds in Ramadan are magnified and you get much more blessings for them. Zakah should be distributed as soon as possible. So as soon as you know your date is coming up for the year, you don't wait and delay till the whole year pass, one month pass after the year. You know, you have to try to give it even before the due date as much as you can to make sure that as soon as that year hit, your zakah is out. Um, if you have missed the zakah, like, you know, um, you, you, whatever it is that you miss, you have to try to make a calculation to the best of your ability and try to pay it. Um, so this is a, and you can go through this in the slide. This is a case study of a sister and the different kinds of expenses she has and which one is zakatable and which is not and how she would calculate it. This is the value. Um, and then you calculate two and a half percent of that, which you will be 1875. There are a lot of organizations that have um, forms that you could collect and work worksheets for the zakat <coughs> that will help you to, uh, calculate this account and, and properly um, structure it. Um, and this is just a summary of some of the things we talked about tonight. Um, it's a third pillar. It purifies your wealth and yourself. Uh, if you don't pay a zakah, it's a major sin. And, um, so this is just some of the, the things that we covered before. CTF here means Children Child Trust Fund. This is short for Child Trust Fund, the same what we talked about. So this is a basic idea of zakah and I know it's a very complicated and very detail oriented, math oriented topic, but um, generally, if you're gonna do it in Ramadan, you know, as a lay person, you should contact your Imam or um, they have organizations that will help you as well. And says, hey, this is what I have and can you help me to calculate my zakah? And they will be happy to assist you generally with that. All right, but don't just take $5 and throw it and say, hey, this is a Mesa car, $10, or just wing it. You really have to calculate 
and make sure you're giving the due amount that you're supposed to give. Um, so many Muslims don't give the zakah. If all the Muslims, just if 10% of Muslims give the correct zakah, we would not have much poor Muslims in our community. You know, we would be able to alleviate poverty in a very big way. And that was the whole idea too. May Allah help us and I hope that we have benefited somewhat from the session. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, before I...